Hi, this is Dr. A, and we're going to look at all the cardiac function assessment tests. So this is a clean cam review. All right, so let's start with markers of cardiac damage. So serum biomarkers have become the centerpiece of the evaluation and management of patients with chest pain. Uh, there are troponins, which are the main ones, the cardiac troponins, just troponin T, troponin I, and troponin C. Um, also done are CKMB and myoglobin. Those are older tests, and depending on which facility uh, you are located at, some physicians may do them, or some physicians may not do them, may just rely solely on the troponin test. So let's start with it, the cardiac troponins. So the troponin is a complex of three proteins, troponin T, troponin I, and troponin C. And it's uh, a protein complex that's located along the thin filaments of mouth fibrils, and it regulates the contraction of the cardiac muscle, and calcium binds to the troponin to initiate the contraction of the heart muscle. So in this diagram here of the actin myofibril, um, you can see uh, the troponin uh, molecules is here. This is tropomycin, and this is the beads or the actin uh, myofibrils. And when calcium binds here, it causes a conformation change with the, the chain kind of twist and allows the thick fibers to the heads to start grabbing on binding sites on the actin proteins and cause that sliding filament model and the contraction. Troponins are found to have tissue-specific isoforms. There are skeletal versus cardiac, which is really good because then we can get specific ones for the cardiac ones. And up to 80% of patients with an acute MI or heart attack will have an elevated troponin level within two to three hours of the emergency department arrival versus six to nine hours or more for the CKMB and other cardiac markers. Um, they stay elevated for weeks after that. Of all cardiac markers, the cardiac troponin is the more <coughs> specific and the most sensitive, so it is the most widely used and has become the gold standard for uh, heart attack and for assessment of um, heart issues. Troponin T and troponin I can be done as biomarkers for more cardiac necrosis. However, troponin I is used the most frequently. So CKMB. It is found on the mitochondria in the cytoplasm of skeletal muscles predominantly, uh, cardiac muscles also, brain and other visceral tissues. Uh, a total CK is non-specific for cardiac damage, so so many things can uh, make it rise again, which just has regular muscle damage, brain damage, and other things like that. But the CKMB is found predominantly in the myocardium, but it can also be found some in skeletal muscle. So the CKMB rises four to six hours after the onset of chest pain and can peak at 12 to 24 hours and then go back down. So one of the advantages of the CKMB versus this troponin is uh, even though it takes a little bit longer for it to rise and peak, it does actually go back down faster where uh, then the troponin which stays elevated for much longer. Although the use of this test is diminishing, some institutions use this can be to aid in the diagnosis of a reinfarction. So that would be a se second heart attack. And the problem there, of course, is because a cardiac troponin can stay elevated for weeks, then sometimes testing for it would not show enough information, may not show enough of an elevation. You, it'd be harder to interpret. So if you had a CKMB, that had dropped um, you know, even to undetectable levels and now is climbing back up, then you can suspect a reinfarction. The myoglobin, there are still some institutions that use a myoglobin in conjunction with a troponin and a CKMB, again, to aid in the diagnosis of an uh, acute MI or heart attack. The myoglobin is released when muscle is damaged. It is non-specific, so it would be released with any kind of muscle damage, including heart muscle damage. Um, its usefulness is in its absence. An absence of myoglobin will rule out an acute MI. Uh, it also rises earlier than troponin or CKMB uh, and uh, clears also faster so, uh, than troponin, so it could also uh, help a little bit with assessing uh, a reinfarction or, uh, again, in its absence, uh, then you know it rules it out. Uh, so this is interesting to see the time lapse of several markers. Um, so we have myoglobin over here, which is just talked about in peak, uh, rises quickly but clears really quickly too. 
So that's uh, important. CKMB uh, rises a little bit slower than myoglobin pr pretty quickly, peaks and goes back down pretty quickly also. And then the two types of troponin, troponin I, troponin T, uh, rise sharply, peak somewhere around the first day, 12 to 24 hours, and then they go back down, but then they stay elevated for, again, weeks, at least a couple of weeks. CK and LEHs aren't really used anymore, so we'll just leave it at that. Okay, so let's look at biomarkers and heart failure. So again, congestive heart failure is the most common cause of heart failure. So again, failure of the heart pump with fluid accumulation. It is monitored using the BNP, which is the uh, B-type or brain-type natriuretic peptide, or the, what the test is called an nt -pro BMP, which is again another protein related to that. Um, that the in the chain of the production of that BNP protein. Uh, and troponins can also be drawn, but you will not see um, the peak that you see uh, in a heart attack. You more would see a steady elevation. So just uh, it's increased usually beyond what's considered normal. Um, and but it it's it just stays there, right? The B, B type or brain type nitriatic peptide is one of three nitriatic peptides. Uh, there's an AMP and a CMP. And the function of these nitriatic peptides is to regulate blood pressure, electrolyte balance, and fluid volume. Uh, BNP is produced primarily by the ventricle especially the left ventricle in response to pressure and stretch so if there's a lot of fluid coming into that left ventricle from the heart so a lot of blood coming in uh, you got a big volume there coming in and it it there's uh, it pushes the ventricle open so there's more pressure and stretch and then that causes the release of that uh, brain top nitriatic peptide and so it counteracts the vasoconstrictive effect of uh, renin, renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the RAS system um, which it increases blood pressure whereas the BMP is going to make the patient dump fluid through the kidneys and lower the blood pressure to lower that pressure in that left ventricle and stuff um, the BNP assays are available on many immunoassay analyzers. Uh, once drawn, a specimen has to be separated from the cells within four hours, and the plasma, which is usually EDTA plasma or, pur or purple top, is refrigerated. There are also a lot of point of care tests for BNP assays, such as the triage one that can be done right there in the emergency department. Um, markers of, of risk for uh, CHD, so um, coronary heart disease, there's a C-reactive protein. It uh, also can be done as a high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and the difference between the two are the cutoff values. But basically, inflammation plays an important role in the development and progression of atherosclerosis in um, CHD. The CRP is a non-specific acute marker of inflammation and is currently used clinically in evaluation of uh, CBD risk. So in patients with a, acute coronary disease, the CRP levels can predict mortality and cardiac complications that would be elevated beyond normal. Um, ideally, with a high sensitivity CRP, you want to be less than one. Uh, you really want to be less than three. Uh, that would, that's um, Less than one's the best. Less than three is definitely a go. If you're above that, then you definitely have inflammation going on. Um, and so high CRP levels will point to a worse prognosis in patients that have acute coronary syndromes. Uh, it is worth noting, again, because CRP is a nonspecific in, uh, marker of inflammation, if the patient has any other inflammatory process going on, like they have sinusitis, they just got, they're having the flu or something like that, you would expect it just to be elevated because of the inflammation process that's going on. So these are better drawn if you're wanting to use them as a marker of CHD risk. Uh, it is much better to draw this when a patient is basically normal and healthy and there's nothing else going on with them and then you can draw them. Homocysteine is a sulfur-containing amino acid that's formed in plasma from the metabolic demethyl demethylation of methionine, which is derived from dietary protein. Early studies demonstrated a clear link between extremely high levels of plasma homocysteine levels, uh, greater than 100 micromoles per liter, and um, CVD, coronary vascular disease, but mildly um, elevated homocysteine was later shown to pose a risk for CVD as well. So again, uh, this can be a marker to something that you would do ahead of time to predict risk of 
uh, the CHD. And then lastly, you have markers of pulmonary embolism. We have the D-dimer testing. So D-dimer is a product of the plasmid-mediated fibrin degradation. So what happens is when your body builds a clot, then uh, once it has done its job, it's supposed to be broken down and degraded. And the presence of D-dimer in the bloodstream is indicative of a current or recent coagulation. And so the formation of a clot and fibrinolysis, which is the uh, degradation of that clot. The D-dimer levels are abnormal in approximately 90% of pulmonary embolism patients. Uh, possible use of troponins and BMP tests. Also, an elevated troponin measurement in patients presenting with PE does appear to have utility in determining their short-term mortality outcome. So um, there you go. Again, D-dimer levels is not very specific. Again, it just means that there was a clot present somewhere. And so uh, usually um, imaging tests are better at detecting and seeing what's going on in pulmonary embolism. That is your last one.